changes and you know from the time of the revivals of the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and all of that the church keeps progressing in knowledge we keep progressing in revelation we must know and the generation that are going to come after us must know more about god than we do am i talking to someone here because the bible says that as we behold him as we behold him as in the mirror we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory that's from one level of glory to another level of glory so as the church beholds christ in his word the church is transformed the encounters the encounter we have with the word uh keeps going up high it is progressive revelation is progressive god keeps revealing himself from generation to generation it will be foolhardy for anyone to believe that they know all that there is to know about god it will be foolhardy for anyone to believe that okay this is what we have been taught and this is what we have known and god keeps revealing himself and you just get stuck to where you are that oh this is what i know and that's what i'm going to speak by and yet god is revealing more of himself god is, has not changed he's the same yesterday today and forever but God is in different dimensions. Over the over the week, I heard I heard a statement. You know, a, a, a teacher was teaching the scriptures, and he said that um, a, a, according to studies, when you study the original Hebrew, that, that the Word of God has every encounter you see in the Word of God, every statement, every story that is told has eight hundred layers of interpretation. Eight hundred that. The Word of God is so multidimensional that you can look at it from this angle and look, check it out from this angle and you say something totally new, revelatory, not contradictory, but totally, you know, complementing what you have seen in this, that, in this, from this angle, complementing and you, someone else can come and look at it from another angle. So we said 800. That is why somebody can take the story of, 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 of the soul and you can have 10 different ministers preach from different angles. You can have the story of the Samaritan and different, you can have 50 different interpretations, men of God, bringing out all kinds of revelation from the Word of God. He says at least they have 800 for each of the Word of God. So you cannot say, how can you know God? Someone can come and say, God says, I am that I am. That statement alone can come out in 800 different dimensions. So God is constantly revealing himself to men. He's constantly breathing himself into men. He's constantly revealing the revelation of his word from time to time. And we grow thereby and when we are given this revelation, it is for us to hold on to it so that we can pass the baton to the next generation who will take it and take it up higher. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And um, can, um, I'm going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 1. Hallelujah. I don't know what I'm going to title this yet. Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to read verse 4. Well, let me back up to verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Hallelujah. According as he has chosen us in him before the coming of the world, that we should be holy and without, and without blame before him in the Lord. Hallelujah. He said, Blessed be the God. And I've always, I've always emphasized this that God starts, when God speaks to us, He speaks from, He uses past tense. Hallelujah. He says, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed not going to bless us. Am I talking to someone here? This should, what, 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 what I'm going to share with you today should be the very, very foundation of our faith. If you're going to build anything on your spiritual life, on your faith, walk with God, build, the, build everything on this message. By the time I'm through, you're going to see what I'm trying to say. 
build it on this person. Your prayer life should come from this dimension. Hallelujah. Your interpretation of the scriptures must come from this dimension. Everything the scripture asks us to do, everything about Christ, everything about the new creation, everything about the word of God, everything about the mind of God comes from this dimension. If you see it from this dimension, then our profiting will be sweet. Hallelujah. So he says, Blessed be the God and Father, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Hallelujah. With all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Remember, the scripture also tells us that he has blessed us with all things that pertain unto life and unto Godliness. Blessed. It is a settled issue. God is no longer trying to bless us. It is a settled issue. Now watch this. Ephesians 1 4. It says, According as he has chosen us in him, chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He chose us before the foundation of the world was laid. And I shared some time back, I said our existence, if our existence transcends the universe. Our existence transcends creation. We were pre-created before creation came into existence. He chose us before he ever said in the beginning, let there be light. Am I talking to someone here? We have been in existence, we have been before him, before the world came into existence. Now follow me. David said, he says, my days are written in your books. He says, before I was formed in my mother's womb, you knew me. He says, my substance was before you. Everything about me was ever before you. So you must understand that your calling, God choosing you, was not as a result of something that took place now, but it was something that took place before the angels were created. Before Satan was created, before the moon was created, before the sun was created, before the oceans were created, before anything came into existence, it was the Father and the Word. And guess who was, was there? Us. I'm going to show you. So he says he chose us. How can he choose us if we were not in existence? So he chose us before the foundation of the earth was the second Timothy chapter one and verse nine. Second Timothy chapter one. Hold on for me. Second Timothy. The first. Verse 5, can, some, can we all read verse 9 together? Who has but saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before, before, <laughs> he says, who has saved us before the world began. Who have called us before the world began. Who have made us holy before the world began. He says, not according to our works. Our works started when the world began. So God is not reckoning with you based on what you do here. God is dealing with us based on what is written concerning us. He says, I know the thought that I think towards you. I know what I have penned down for you. I know the glory that I have penned down. I know the days that I have appointed for you. I know the things that you are going to do. I have planned everything out to the last letter. I'm going to show you something here. Hallelujah. So he said, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose according to his own purpose and grace 
which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. He created me in Christ before the world began. Remember in Revelation, Jesus was referred to as the Lamb that was what slain before the foundation of the earth was laid. We think Jesus was slain 2,000 years ago. No, he wasn't. He was slain before the world began. He was slain before the foundation of the world was laid. The atonement for my sin had already taken place before I even came here. God made that arrangement, established it. What played out in the realm of the physical is the fulfillment of what has already been written for me. So he said, he saved us in him. He chose us in him before the foundation of the earth was laid. So understand that nothing in the realm of the physical, nothing in the realm of the physical can jeopardize your destiny if you understand your position and your predisposition in the realm of the spirit. Nothing. I'm still coming. I'm not there. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. If you're there with me, say amen. Romans chapter 8. Give me one seven. Verse 29, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, or let's back up to verse 28, hallelujah. So he says, and we know, are you there? He says, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. When did he call you? Come on, church. When did he call you? When you asked that the call here, when you came out and gave your life to Christ? Now, he called us before the foundation of the earth was laid. So he says, Who? He said to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, read verse 29 with me. He says, For whom he did foreknow. What does it mean to foreknow? Ah, church. For whom he did for no, for whom he did for no, he also did what predestinated. Ah, he knew today. He knew me. He knew my personality. He knew my strength. He knew my weakness. He knew my glory. He knew my end. He knew my beginning. He knew everything. He knows everything about me. And with all of that, he now predetermined my life. That means that he declared the end of my journey from the beginning. He laid out a road map for me that by the time I come to this planet, this and this and this and this and this is what is going to happen. So he said, for whom he did foreknow, he also predestinated to be what? To be conformed to the image of his son. I don't have a choice. I must look like Christ at the end of the day. It has nothing. There is nothing on the planet that can change it. So when I pray, I pray because I know what is taking place in me. When I study the word, I know what is taking place because there is a predestinated will that is working in me. He says all things are working together for the good. And so he has predestinated me to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. My destiny is to be like Jesus. My destiny is to look like him. My destiny is to talk like him. My destiny is to operate like him. So it does not matter what I'm going through. You may not see right now, but something is working on the inside of me. It is beyond me. It is beyond the devil. It is beyond the attacks of the enemy. It is beyond angels. It is beyond the elements of nature. God prepared this and you are not present. So they don't even know the course that my life is going to take. The Bible 
say that a man that is born of the spirit is like the wind. He said you neither know where he's coming from or where he's going. They cannot decipher my destiny. And so when Jesus came, however, she when Jesus came, he came in a land. He became a carpenter's son. Satan was looking. He didn't know what was going on. Because this matter has been determined before he was created. This matter has been determined before his heart fell. This matter has been determined before demons came into existence. And because he was threatened by Jesus, he was accusing him. He was persecuting him. He led him to the cross. He thought he was willing.
but they do not have the capacity to engage you. Do you know why? Because you are here before them. You were in existence before them. You know what they don't know. Satan is not, is not all known. Hallelujah. So, all of that is to establish a point with us, and I'm going somewhere, that we must understand that our story did not start on this planet and is not going to end on this planet. We are an eternal being. What does eternal life mean? I've not been able to find a suitable or a good definition for it, but I'm working on it. But according to scriptures, according to reasoning and meditation, spiritual meditation, eternal life is not subject to time. That is the life of God. It encompasses the past, the present, and the future, and it all seems as one before Him. Hello? It, eternal life is the life that has no limitation. Hallelujah. You know when they say, you, you know, in, in, in human terms, they tell you that you can't change the past, right? But in eternal life, you can change the past. God can go back to the beginning and rearrange things. That can crush our mind if we try to reason it. It's just like we try to reason how did God exist. That is how life is. That in the realm of the spirit, eternity, there is no past, there is no present, there is no future. All is within one space. And God sees everything and walks everything all within one space. That is where, that is why you can hear a message that was speak three years ago and it will be addressing your situation today. You can hear a prophecy that was given in 1983 and to see my seed, that person was, and you're hearing to do that, I mean 2023, and to see my seed, that person was addressing your situation and uh, that was a testimony by, by uh, let me, 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 let by um, Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn shared the testimony I've shared it here before. He had a broadcast, you know, when he would heal and he would say, oh, there's a person with a yellow dress and all of that. And, you know, your name is so so and so, but God is healing you right now. So, they had the recording last week. Am I talking someone? They had the recording of that particular studio, you know, of the studio. They recorded that program, but they were not able to air it live. So they kept it and they aired it the next week. The following week. And the woman was wearing yellow. <laughs> and she had the exact situation the man of God was addressing. He said that the woman watching you, you're, you're sitting on the, on the sofa right now, you're watching, you're putting on a yellow dress, you live in Susan, so your name is Susan, so and everything. And God says he's healing you right now. When testimony came to Benedict, he said, when did this happen? The woman said, but well, we recorded this in video. You shall not even sat on that chair to watch the TV before heaven made a return for her. Mm. Mm. Don't toy with this life that we have. Mm. Are you with me? Yes. Hebrews chapter 4. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4, and I'm going to start reading from verse 1. When we understand what we just shared, you know, a few minutes back, God designed that mystery and that knowledge to bring us into rest in Him. For us to understand that we are not here by accident, 
we, our life is not just determined by circumstances, that there is one who has arranged and planned. In fact, the translation says that he rejoiced as he planned our future. He rejoiced as he planned our existence. Hallelujah. So, you must understand that God intends this knowledge to bring us into rest, not complacency. Two different things. To rest is different from to be complacent. You know, you just like, you now go through life and say, well, whatever will be, will be, it is already written, kiss, ira, ira, and all. No, that's not what God is saying. Because we're men of the Spirit. You have to understand and find out what the will of the Lord is. That which was written. There's a package for you with your name on it. There is a destiny that has all the guidelines and all the footprints that are supposed to lead you to the glory that God has ordained. And so you must, as you walk with God, pray, and then it is revealed to you. And as it is revealed to you, you walk in rest. So that no matter what is going on around you, you are assured that this is what is going to happen. So no matter the opposition to you, you are assured that this is what is going to take place. Amen? So that is what the Word of God is intended to do. So Hebrews chapter 4, let me put it on. For unto us was the gospel preached, from verse 2, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. The word that they heard did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. He says, for, for we which have believed, we do do what? We enter into rest because we are in Christ. Hallelujah. We enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Now let's do the last sentence together. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. The works were finished, hallelujah, before the foundation of the earth was laid. They could not enter into God's rest because they doubted everything that came before them. And the Bible tells us that even though God had finished the work before they were even created, he was talking here about the children of Israel, that when God brought them out of Egypt, God gave a promise that I am taking you to a land that is flowing with what? With milk and honey. And so, but every step of the way, they couldn't believe God. Every step of the way, when they get hungry, they will cry, they will, everything, they will, they, they will oppose God, they will say things they were not supposed to say. Psalm 78, let me quickly read that to us. Psalm 78, David chronicled it and showed us what they did. And I quickly want to say this to us so that we will not fall victims, hallelujah. Our faith will be built up enough to believe God for what he has promised. Psalm 78. He said, marvelous things did he in the sight, from verse 12, in the sight of their fathers, in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He said, he divided the Red Sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters to stand as an, as an heap. In the daytime also, he led them with a the cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He claimed the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of great death. He brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers, and they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking me for their loss. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God, can God furnish the table in the wilderness? Behold, they smoked the rock. The waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wrought. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel. What was the problem here? God gave his word, but they will not believe his word. Every time they face an opposition, they become afraid, forgetting the word of God. I said, God said they did not have faith in me. So, so but, 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 but when we come to the New Testament believers, everything that God has said he will do, do we really believe? In the human life, we must understand, like I said, in the human, 
Oh my God. Our spirit, our spirit is alive unto God and unto everything that God has to offer. But we also carry a human life and a human nature and we live in a human world. And in the human world, there is an expected order of outcomes. Am I talking to someone here? Because when Satan came in in the beginning, he changed the system. And so, all through human existence, there is an expected order of outcomes. In other words, if you hit your leg upon the stone, you will feel pain. Am I talking to someone here? If you cut your wrist, your blood will drain out and you will die. If you catch cancer, it is a death sentence. In court, there is an expected order of what of outcomes. If you don't make money, you will be miserable, or you can be kicked out, or you will not enjoy the benefits of life. If you don't get some things, there is always an expected order of outcomes. So the human world was like a small village that a tyrant took over and every day he would abuse them over and over and over and over and over again. He would take the children, he would kill the children every time he wants to kill. He would take their farms and eat all their produces. They cannot sleep at night. They sleep with one eye open and all their lives from generation to generation. Whenever they hear the sound of the feet of the enemy, they know the outcome. Whenever they hear the sound of the feet of sickness, they can easily anticipate the outcome. Whenever they hear the sound of financial crisis, they can easily project the outcome of what their life is going to be. Whenever they encounter some type of accident or things that we handle, they automatically know what will happen. Am I talking to someone here? And then there is the fear of that outcome that, have, that will break their heart, that make them miserable. But then a man came and took over the land. The Bible says when a man, when a strong man gives his goods, the goods are safe. But when a stronger man comes, he will bind the strong man and spoil his goods. Am I talking to someone here? So when Jesus came, he bound Satan and he defeated Satan. Now the people who have been all their lives bound to fear, to now walk in freedom has now become a problem. Because their mind is already programmed to expect certain outcomes. Hallelujah. So in this order of new things, someone is saying by the stripes of Jesus you were healed. And you only need to believe it. And yet there is sickness in your body. So you are caught between determining two outcomes. Either the outcome that you have come to know from generations to generations, that the outcome of sickness is either death or distress, or you have to believe this new order that all I need to do is confess and believe and I will be healed. I don't have to take the drugs. I can, it is now left to you. And that is where Christianity is today. Oscillating between human order of outcomes and the divine order of outcomes. I might talk to someone here. So God now says, enter into rest. Do not be afraid. Enter into rest. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, Be anxious for nothing. The place of prayer, I talked last week, the place of prayer, God determined the place of prayer as a place of rest. It is not a place of agitation. If you are agitated and you are anxious and you are all troubled on the inside, that is not the time to pray. Am I talking to someone here? That is not the time to pray. Make sure that all the agitation, all the anxiety, and all the, make sure it goes away. Take a nap. That's what I said last week. Go take a nap. If you're so burdened and you everything torn in your mind and all that, that is not the time to pray because you can't pray effectively. Mm. 
It's not going to happen. Hallelujah. David wanted to build the Lord a tabernacle, a house of prayer. God said, you cannot build me a house of prayer because all your life has been about chaos. You have waged too many wars, you have killed too many people, you have shed too many people, but there is someone that is going to build me a house of prayer. And the God said, your son Solomon, for he shall be a man of rest. For he shall be what? A man of rest. So that is the foundation upon which the house of prayer in the realm of the spirit built upon. It is a place of rest. After the turmoil and after the, 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 all the things that you know that are agitated against you, whether it is bills, whether it is sickness and the fear and everything, make sure that everything is shut down. When it's shut down and you are in the right frame of mind, your emotions are stable and then they begin to recount the goodness of the Lord and begin to bless His name. Then from there, the Holy Spirit will take over. Then your prayer will become more effective. Am I talking to someone here? Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 8 from verse 22, just give you examples of rest. When Jesus said, let us go over to the other side, the Bible says that there was a storm that arose while we were in the boat. And the Bible reports that Jesus was sleeping in the midst of the storm. And they went to wake him and said, Master, care is not that we perish. And the Bible said he arose from rest. And he rebuked the storm and said, Peace be still. And there was a great calm. And then the next question that he asked, he says, Where is your faith? Jesus never prayed in chaos. He never prayed with agitation. Everything around him, they were begging water out, they were confused, they didn't know what to do. But Jesus came out from a place of rest and he says, peace be still. Hallelujah. Why could he display such authority from a place of rest? Because he understands that even before the elements of the storms and the water were created, he has been. And those things answer to him. Amen? Amen. And whether you accept this or not, those things also answer to you. Philippians chapter 1 verse 28. Yeah, I'm around you. Can someone read it for me? Philippians 1 28. Philippians chapter 1. And in nothing, in, I am not terrified by your adversity. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Which is, which is to them an evident of your perdition, mm -hmm. to you of salvation and that of God. And in nothing, did he say in some things? No, he says in nothing terrified by your adversary. For to them, it is a sign that they will be destroyed. He said it is a token of perdition. It is a sign to them that they will be destroyed. And to you of salvation, that means that you are already saved from it. Your confidence in the word of God is a sign to the enemy that they will be destroyed. That they've lost it. In nothing terrified by your adversary. Be anxious. He says, be anxious for nothing. Don't let anything shake your faith. Don't let anything shake your faith. That verse 28, the message translation says, it says, not flinching or dodging in the slightest before the opposition. Not flinching or dodging in the, in the, in the slightest before the opposition. Your courage and unity will show them what they are up against. Your courage and your confidence, confidence will show the enemy what he is up against. Jesus said, I laid a stone in Zion. I don't know the scriptures, when you, when you read it, it will blow your mind. You should understand, he said, I laid a stone in Zion. He says, it's going to be a walk of offense. He said, whoever falls upon this stone shall be broken in pieces. And he said, whoever this stone falls upon, it will be blinded to power. So there is no way, whether they come against you or you against them, there is always one person that will win. It is you. He said, let them come. They are afraid that they're going to put something on your doorstep. Somebody is somewhere making you do. When you come to this revelation, let them go ahead. Oh, there's a family, something, something. That is, there is nothing for the believer like a generational curse. 
word of God. If the word of God is true, then there is nothing in the life of a believer that is called generational curse. The people that generational curse still thrive in their life are people who have not caught the revelation of what God has done and who they are. From scriptures, it says, in nothing terrified by your adversary. What do you mean generational curse? Who? If your life is hidden in God through Christ Jesus, what do you mean generational curse? If my destiny has been printed, if he has called me before the foundation of the earth was laid, what do you mean generational curse? The moment I got born again, he stopped with me. That does not mean the enemy will not try to repeat what has been happening, but by revelation, as God spoke to the seas and spoke to his proud ways, he said, This far shall your proud ways go, not further. And the sea and the waters did not exceed it since that day. You draw the line. If they have been having poverty for generations, when it comes to you, it stops. If they have been premature death for generations, when it comes to you, it stops. We are not afraid. You see, when someone was talking to me, I can't remember a person, we never grew beyond 50. You know, people die at 50 and I said, but well, what are you talking about? You are a new creation in Christ. That has nothing to do with you. That has nothing whatsoever to do with you. Oh, I break every generation of God. Every day you are going for deliverance for it. So when are you ever going to be delivered? He says, your long life I will satisfy. He says, he that watches over is your majesty. Is God the liar? This is the problem we have. The teachings, the prayer, the dispositions in Christendom, they don't align with the promises of God. It makes God look as if he's a liar. Because nobody is willing to stand and not flinch. Nobody is willing to stand and not flinch in the face of opposition. And when you go, when they are trying to use humanistic approach to interpret spiritual realities. Our kingdom is not of this world. It supersedes this world. Let me share two things with you, and then we'll go. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21 to 22, just go with this and meditate on these things. Please, meditate on it. When you embrace them, you will discard some things. It depends on what you embrace. People teach all kinds of things. What you embrace is what will work for you. If they teach you that because you because you did this work and they sacked you from it, and you did the other work, they sacked you from it, they tell you that, oh, there's a generational stuff that is gone. If you believe it, it will keep working. Satan will keep using it. Am I talking to you? But if you if you if you move to another dimension of God. And you see things from another dimension, and you decide to walk in victory concerning that which is written concerning you. You're out. It does not matter if you get sacked ten times, you do not look at the things that are said. You are not regarding it any longer. Hallelujah. Someone said, Oh, because this thing happened, that thing happened, and all of that. Something happened one day. When I wanted to pick my first car for the first part that I, I was doing. First time, I went to the rental shop, and then so they gave me the car. And then so we, you know, we, we started moving on the road, and all of a sudden, the car broke down. First day at work, the car broke down. So we had to call the company, they said, oh, we can't start working. And I was in need of money, I needed to start working immediately. And they called and everything. And you know, the car was not available, so I had to go back the next day. And then someone made a statement, ah, I hope it's not bad luck that is following this person. Ah. I said, where? Because it had broke down. Does that change the covenant over me? I said, it just broke down. Let another guy break down three weeks. For three weeks, it still does not change the fact that I'm blessed. Let Satan break those cars down. It still will not change the 
fact that I am blessed. Am I talking to someone here? It will not drive you to a place of anxiety. Oh, they are following me from home. Oh, they are following me. This is happening. No! We are not of them that draw back onto perdition. We don't draw back. We don't flinch in the face of opposition. We keep moving forward. David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The Bible said that when Goliath was, the whole of Israel was afraid. The Bible said that they feared. But when David came, David reminded them of the promises of God. David shared his testimonies. He said a bear came when I slew the bear. A lion came, God killed the lion. He said the same God that did all of that, that's my testimony. And I've heard in the covenant and in the books that God is the covenant God of our Father. He brought them out of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. They saw all the miracles. David said, I'm ready to go. Every other person did not believe that which was written concerning Israel. And they became afraid of Goliath. And then he said, This is circumstance this things have been brought up. What does the Bible say? The Bible said, When Goliath pulled up, David did not move, but he ran towards Goliath. Mm. What did I know? Mm. <laughs> He ran towards Goliath. The Bible says that we have been born by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. You have been born incorrupt. It is not possible for your life to be corrupted. I didn't write it. He says I've been born by the incorruptible seed. I don't care the dreams you have. Your life cannot be corrupted. Your life cannot be defiled. Kabosi Kafaya, you walk on this reality, and heaven will stand up and respond to you. Are you following me? First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21 to verse 23. It says, Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are what? Kaya Kala. He says, All things are yours, sir. All things. Did he say some things? What does all things mean? They were created for you. How can all things belong to you? Because you were before all things. So when we say, ah, ah, you know when Jesus would pray, Jesus would say, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the earth, before the foundation of the earth was laid. If I stand up here now and I pray that prayer, some of you look at me and say, no, I think for that year. <laughs> if I say, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the foundation of the earth was laid. And not be with the calling and the grace that I had with you before the foundation of the earth was laid. Some people will think I'm preaching blasphemy, but I'm just saying scriptures. It is written there. He chose me. He called me before the foundation of the earth was laid. He knew me. He knew me even before I knew myself. So and I know that there's something beautiful written for me. So I just said, Father, that glory that I had with you. <laughs> before you said, let there be light. Lord, let that glory come upon me. The glory that is not determined by anything on this planet. So he says, all things are yours. He says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. He says, all are yours and you are what? Christ and Christ is God's. All are yours. Romans 8.38 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, can you see it? Neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able, will be able, will have the capacity, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. He said, for as many as the Father has given me, he said, no man can pluck them out of my hands. I want you to rise to your feet. I am in Christ. The greatest glory. You see, because our mind has been so abused by the enemy, we have been disenfranchised, we have been abused, we have been tortured, we have been denied, we have been tossed to and fro. The gospel seems as if it is too good to be true. That 
that this can be true. But when God says that He has lavished His grace, He has lavished His love over us, God has spoiled us. This is a spoiling message. The gospel is God spoiling His children. Every time I want to give my children something, I am always delighted. When I speak to my first son and he tells me, Father, I need money, I'm thinking of how I can make him happy. I'm thinking of, oh, you sure? Do you, you sure that would be enough? I, if somebody gets what I'm trying to say, I want to do more for him. I want him to be comfortable. If I, I, being really human, know how to give good gifts to my children, how much more my heavenly Father, he rejoices to bless me. He says, No good thing will he withhold from them that love him. He would withhold any good thing. He gave us all things. He said, He gave us all things. He said, If he can give us Christ, how will he not freely give us? Come on. 